Good, uh, good evening. Um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Emma Flynn and Christine Kerrigan, who I saw talk at an event uh, earlier this year, slightly weird event, as we're about, but um, <laughs> at, um, not that weird, kind of weird, uh, a thing called Vision London, which is a sort of, it's kind of trade show, but for future things that might happen in architecture. It's, and it's slightly more interesting than EcoBuild. Um, in fact, there were very interesting things there, and there's also things that are less, you know, but less plumbing exhibits and stuff. But it's, um, it's quite nice that they, there's an attempt to gather together uh, people from industry and architecture and designers to think about how you might, how we might um, build stuff in the future, make architecture. And what's nice about um, the work that Christian and uh, Emma are doing is that it's research, but based in architecture practice, which in a way doesn't, it shouldn't be that unusual, but it sort of is a bit unusual, um, the way that they're trying to actually connect the two bits together. So thanks very much for coming in. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, Will. Um, yes, so we're going to give you, I think, a kind of rapid whirlwind through quite a few research projects, which we've broadly titled Living Architecture. But you, you'll see that they're kind of yeah, quite different uh, projects. Um, I'm going to have to move behind here, so I think I could really be able to see uh, half the room. Um, but uh, before we do that, I'd like to just give everyone a, a, like a, a brief overview to our practice. We are a, a, an architecture practice. We're based in Waterloo, London. Um, and, um, and, then, and then Christian's going to speak about some of the kind of broader thinking and potential of living architecture. Um, um, and then we're going to go on to some of these research projects um, exemplified uh, through work we're doing in practice um, and some more speculative proposals. Um, so yes, we're a, about 30 strong practice. We're based in Waterloo and we do a kind of variety of work from public buildings to residential, commercial, um, schools, youth centres, you name it. But about four years ago, we decided to set up a R&D group um, and this was really in response to what we felt was the kind of increasing need for innovation within the building industry. Um, and we all know the kind of challenges we're facing. By the middle of the century, two-thirds of us are going to be living in cities, and the kind of uh, environmental impact of our, our kind of collective actions um, or, uh, are going to produce a, a real demand on resources and services. Um, and then climate change, of course, produced by CO2 levels rising, um, uh, is, is a kind of resultant impact of our kind of wasteful behaviour. Um, and we've all heard about these kind of extreme weather events that are coming from that. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but as, in response to that kind of crisis, the UK is committed to a carbon reduction of 80% by 2050. And the construction industry as a whole accounts for approximately half of the UK's entire global kind of emissions, uh, sorry, entire emissions um, generated from fossil fuels either used in the construction or the operation of buildings. Um, and, and with that knowledge, it's, it's kind of fundamentally clear we, we play a huge role in that, the, the kind of total carbon emissions. So, and if, if we're going to meet this commitment, it kind of means that, or essentially means that all buildings, whether new or existing, need to be carbon um, positive by around 2040, which is a massive challenge for the industry, um, especially as we're still kind of building like the Victorians. Um, and we need kind of increment, we, we need kind of real visionary thinking, not these kind of incremental step change to achieve that. Um, and at stage, a studio, we've been kind of exploring some um, speculative proposals and research projects which intend to kind of look at making and driving these kind of more radical um, new ideas and approaches um, to create these bigger shifts in the way we do things. And this kind of challenge and thinking that we were kind of acutely aware of as architects practicing in business led us to um, develop this future timeline, which kind of just evolved as a very fluid thing in the office. This is the wall of our meeting room. And we decided to kind of try and map out this pathway to 2050 to try and meet these kind of carbon reduction goals. What do we need to do to actually meet that? Where are we now? What are the challenges we're facing? And this actually extends all the way around the office from 2050 to when coal apparently will run out in 2427, all the way around the other office. And we use this as a way of documenting the research we were doing, um, research other people were doing, challenges, um, 
And also we decided to kind of segregate it into two, two layers, kind of technological and the behavioral. Um, and, and it kind of captures the kind of predicted step changes, both technological and social, um, and the accompanying kind of political and, and legislative strategies to, to meet these goals. So interestingly, we then, once we got this information, we kind of overlaid a typical building program on this. And that's what really kind of brought it into context with us. With, with, with the larger scale of public buildings taking five years, you've only got about six till you actually reach, reach 2050 when you put them end to end. And it really drove home that need for, you know, um, these bigger steps rather than this incremental learning. We need to make big change fast and learn from every building we do as a practice. So from that, I mean, that, that kind of uh, triggered an ambition to really kind of start this R&D group, but it also became a project in itself. And um, we're digitizing this currently to make it interactive and collaborative. Um, and it, it kind of set up this whole kind of uh, stream in the office about how we work and what, what are we researching, how are we going to structure this. Um, and we, really, we have a very strong environmental fo focus as a practice, and R&D for us lies at this intersection between design, technology, and environment. We have an in-house environmental engineer. Um, we work a lot with uh, CAD tools and do a lot of in-house testing and analysis, and even are working with a number of software developers to kind of push the boundaries of, of some of their uh, uh, programs and make them work better and easier for arch architects. It's all about that user interface. Um, and, and, and since that point, we've kind of expanded into a whole territory of research. And today, Christian and I are, brief, or are gonna focus on this kind of future th cities uh, think, thinking, uh, think tank that we've kind of developed, and this idea of living architecture. Um, what we do is highly collaborative. Um, we are very small cogs in very big projects a lot of the time. Um, and what we've become good at is kind of connecting um, people with, who are much, uh, much cleverer and um, have, a, have a great kind of depth of expertise, either in academia or um, in industry, to kind of make some of these projects happen, which I'll come on to you in a second. Um, so these living architecture projects have come, up, uh, come from this kind of collective um, platform of collaborators. Um, we all kind of came together, I think, from a mutual interest in nature and how important nature is or the potential of nature to really increase the resilience of our built environment. And a number of projects have kind of emerged from this kind of collaborative platform we've been building. Um, this is one project, and it's probably the most speculative of all the projects that we've been working on, but it's with a lady called Dr. Rachel Armstrong. I'm sure many of you know her work. She's the pre Professor for Experimental uh, Architecture, a great title, I think, at uh, Newcastle University. But sh she asked us to speculate on how we might design a starship for a future. So a starship that has to travel, you know, thousands, uh, hundreds and thousands of miles from this planet to the next in search of somewhere for us to live once we've ruined and uh, used up all the resources in our own planet. We kind of thought that was quite a depressing uh, start to a project brief and kind of thought about the challenge in terms of how do we design for resource-constrained environments, a bit like Earth itself, and how, we, how do we start to design architecture that was, is productive, is generative, is uh, processes waste, removes pollutants to create a kind of semi closed environment um, um, and looked into very much into kind of ecological systems and uh, thinking. So for us, um, all these projects are really centered on nature and it's kind of, and we're just fascinated in its ability to really survive these kind of extreme changes in environment. Um, and its resilience is kind of delivered through this capacity to adjust to climate change, um, moderate damages, um, take advantage of opportunities, cope with consequences. Basically, it's capacity to adapt. And we try and capture that in, um, I think, all the projects we're going to show you today. Um, so instead of building like the Victorians and, and, and building this kind of inert building stock, we want to look towards responsive buildings that can adapt to change, uh, conserve resources, even 
produce resources um, and um, play an essential role in kind of wider ecosystems. Um, so we, we've kind of taken this on board in a lot of our kind of speculative proposals of the future city. Um, and instead of, you know, this kind of inert building st stock, we've, we're exploring the design of responsive services, ecological building systems that kind of actively moderate and adapt to the surrounding environment. And uh, I think, Christian, you're now just going to give a sure. brief overview of, of kind of the, the future potential of this, these technologies. Okay, thank you, Emma. So, yes, I mean, so part of this is about creating projects with these sort of concepts and these new materials. Um, and part of this is about finding ways to progress. So one of the ways that we started, this is about six or seven years ago, um, working with Dr. Rachel Armstrong, um, she had this idea of Venice and with the rising sea levels, is there a way, is there a system um, in an architectural setting that can actually save Venice from uh, these rising sea levels? So a thing that you'll hear us talk about quite a lot of time is this sort of natural uh, technological environments. And this here is a, is a, is a drawing um, which a uh, rendering looking at this environment as a symbiotic system. Uh, symbiotic systems tend to work with each other in order to create a, a, a more um, successful uh, union. So you're looking here at some uh, rock formations. Now this is coming from a science called living technology. It's a new area um, in, in terms of scientific practice about looking at technology that has uh, characteristics of living systems. And I'll go on to show you some, some, some real-time experiments. But in this um, drawing, we were talking about um, a calcite producing um, cell that could grow structures uh, around the foundations of, of Venice. Um, the cells here, um, as we visualized, were a protocell. A protocell is, an, is a synthetic um, oil droplet that was um, sort of um, came across by Dr. Martin Hansik, uh, who's a chemist, and he observed this potential for the cell to interact with its environment, but it's completely uh, organic in its structure. It doesn't have DNA, but it has characteristics of movement, and uh, you can program it essentially to, to, um, to react with its environment. So learning from this, um, this um, scientific practice, Rachel and I started to develop um, this, this imaginary um, scenario of how Venice might uh, potentially be, uh, be saved from sinking. Um, so the piles in Venice, I'm not sure if you know, a lot of them are, them are wooden. So these could actually create um, almost like a skin around the foundations to, to, to actually uh, prolong the life of the foundations and to actually secure the base of it um, over time. Um, so these are drawings looking at how the, as an organic structure might evolve within the urban uh, fabric. Uh, again, we are looking at um, learning from other uh, natural environments, and these rock pools were a sort of crustacean uh, within the canals of Venice, but they are very much about looking for a language, an architectural language, to explore this, um, this scientific uh, research. Um, this is um, one experiment, which is a proof of concept, which um, I worked directly with the scientist to um, look at, um, is this possible to um, create a drawing uh, that draws itself? That was a question. Um, and this was almost like an architectural question in, in, in its, in its um, realization, but it also had this proof of concept. If you can do that, can we actually make material and move and be dynamic by itself. So in the red um, ink, we, we created uh, millions of protocells and inhabited the ink droplet um, in order to um, essentially have lifelike characteristics. I'm just going to show you a short video um, of what we um, found or observed.
So what you're looking at is a small bit of canvas. It's about this big. Um, and these are just normal stones from my garden. I'm placing um, a very high concentration of salt. You would have seen the pipette in the middle. The ink starts to, starts to react and starts to push through the canvas. Essentially what's happening is the cells are figuring out, they're looking for this salt hydrate and essentially pushing, working together, a very, um, we observe this at, at different scales. This is very much for the human eye, but you can observe this at nanoscale. And essentially they're pushing and trying to figure out how to move through this, essentially a very complex uh, landscape. These pebbles, the this, this stone, the actual canvas itself is a very complex environment for cells to move. But they start to find their way through and on the top left. They start to push through uh, these small stones, um, which is quite, uh, um, was quite, it was quite astounding to observe that, um, standing back and to see that actually the system does actually work as a proof of concept, albeit at a very small scale. Um, you'll see, um, you'll see that the it changes direction as well. As the gradient moves from, um, from the center, the cells will always look for the highest gradient of salt uh, content. So as a result, the, the outcome is always, um, it's always changing. And, and in some cases, it's completely unpredictable uh, what will happen. And you can see it starts to take direction in other directions. Um, so What we're talking about here is um, a sort of active materials. And this is just, we've just recently published this in Advances in Unconventional Computing. It's, it's a first scientific paper that enca encaptures new ways of, of uh, possi potential computing in the future. And this is computing using, um, in this sense, biological behavior rather than um, electrical um, electrical environments. So as Emma sort of introduced that if taking these sort of concepts, how do you actually look at future architecture? Um, and this Starship um, project with Rachel Armstrong, which is about this self-sustaining uh, environments or cities, we begin to speculate, can we grow structures on the outside of, uh, of buildings? Can we have porous structures? where nature actually, uh, <laughs> is that for me? Sorry. <laughs> that wasn't meant to happen. <laughs> is it you, is it me? <laughs> it's me. <laughs> um, so we're looking, at, um, we're looking at using these concepts to create uh, and, and visualize a f uh, an architecture, which is achievable, and we're, by proof of concept, I mean that this is um, working collaboratively. We can achieve these uh, these ends. Um, I'm going to hand over to Emma now, who's going to talk about a few more projects in practice. Okay. Um, thanks, Christian. So, bringing that back to kind of where we're at now, and how do we start kind of aiming for the sky, literally, in, in some in some ways, you know, what, what's the first step on this timeline to kind of achieving some of these quite ambitious goals? So, I mean, the first the first research that we've been doing for a number of years now is, is research into algae, and I don't think a research a research group would be complete without some research into algae, but it really is quite fascinating. Um, so we've been working with Brunel University. I think the majority of these pro projects we're going to show now are work we're doing with Brunel University. Um, and they've been incredibly uh, helpful and um, have really enabled us um, through finding funding mechanisms and other expertise to kind of develop some of these projects further. So we've been working with Brunel, uh, Brunel University, um, Sustainable Now Technologies, who are an amazing Californian outfit. Um, the biggest algae geeks you can imagine, based in California, um, and the Center for Process Innovation, based in Sunderland, to try and explore the potential of algae, algae technology, um, with, without presuming you know, what it could be, just to explore you know, um, its real potential. Um, so we've been we're doing a huge number of tests with the aim of kind of initially exploring whether this algae could 
uh, fuel or power the building or be used as a kind of carbon offset method for buildings in construction. Um, and we've been working towards, since this point, working towards a kind of algae facade prototype, which will sequest CO2 and produce high value uh, algae products, potentially for sale um, uh, or food stocks, um, with a long term ambition of creating biofuel to power the building. Um, so the, this, this is kind of one of the early photobioreactive facade designs, which uses the process of photosynthesis to cultivate uh, algae in these kind of uniquely designed bioreactors um, made of glass. Um, and the idea is that it captures carbon from the atmosphere, and we use that to offset the building's carbon footprint and energy needs. And it's a kind of multifaceted energy, re renewable energy source for us, because um, they also act as a solar, solar thermal collector so providing a direct heat um, for the building and actually shading the building's interior from the sun. Um, and we're quite interested, and it's part of research going forward, to see how, if we can optimise that shading potential. So as levels of kind of sunshine and solar radiation increase, the algae increases its growth rate and hence its, uh, hence its density. Uh, and shading potential, adapting in real time to changes in the surrounding environment. Um, and and we, we want to be able to manipulate this process to kind of accurate, ac accurately regulate temperatures um, or the internal temperatures of the building within. Um, and we're quite, a lot of our research is looking at how we make this a holistic strategy. So not just a building facade, but how it's engineered into the building systems um, and it impacts all areas. So it can actually provide water filtration, power, heat and light. Um, these are some competition entries that we've done for Hong Kong Science Park using this technology. Um, and we've got quite a few prototypes that we've been working on with SNT um, and we actually have a lot of this in our office. We sit around kind of bubbling flasks of, of, of algae um, and we use this as a research tool really, um, exploring this idea of a, a carbon capture technology um, and how we might use this for either new construction projects or retrofit as a biological method to kind of offset the carbon emissions produced in the construction. Um, alongside that, this isn't such an enticing uh, graphic image, this Excel spreadsheet, but um, we've been working on um, a, a carbon tracker with a, a QS team, Quantum Consulting, to, uh, which is linked to a BIM model, to accurately or well, attempt to uh, calculate or at least get an understanding of how much carbon is involved in the materials we specify. So going into absolutely every part of the building's makeup to kind of get a rough understanding of, of the amount of CO2 uh, involved in uh, the production of some of these materials. And from that, what we think is a really exciting thing is this allows us as architects to go to our client. Well, firstly, it informs our design decisions and by uh, tampering around with this Excel spreadsheet, we can optimise the building's form, the material choice to try and reduce that load initially. And then secondly, it provides us with the ammunition to go to a client and say, look, this, this is, you know, the embodied carbon of the building. We need um, a certain carbon offset strategy. And then we get into the territory of actually be able to talk about some of these technologies and devices as a way of offsetting um, the, the building's uh, embodied carbon so and, and looking towards creating a true carbon zero building or even potentially a carbon positive building. Um, another project I'm just going to touch on is um, we've been doing a lot of research into phase change materials. I, I imagine you've probably all come across these now but they're a really exciting technology. Um, and they're, they're, they're an example of this kind of dynamic skin technology. Whilst not strictly living in this sense, um, they're able to adapt to and harvest from the kind of clim immediate climatic environment. And this is a, um, a product actually by uh, called Glass X, um, which is a salt hydrate. Um, and it provides, it's about this thick, but it provides the, the, the kind of thermal storage equivalent to a concrete wall of about 20 centimetres in thickness. So it's a really exciting uh, technology and it passively, so without energy, provides heating and cooling throughout the day. Um, and so uh, 
heat is stored within the material through a melting process. You can see this crystallization. The, the, the salt crystals melt um, um, and aid cooling. And as the temperature drops in the space, um, potentially uh, as we approach the evening, it slowly releases that heat and goes through this recrystallization process. And we really like the fact that this kind of dyna dyna dynamic nature is reflected also aesthetically within, um, you can read the performance through its actual materiality. Um, we've been doing another number of projects with Brunel students looking and developing a kind of internal wall system um, that is essentially a kind of passive kind of uh, radiator. It kind of uh, can regulate the temperature of the room. Um, another really interesting technology that we've also spent a lot of time exploring is um, bacteria bioluminescence. So this is a project, again, we're doing with Brunel. Um, but also an amazing um, biologist, Simon Park, from Surrey University. Um, you might have come across him if you know Bompus and Parr. He's worked with them on a number of installations looking at um, using uh, this bioluminescent bacteria. And we're really interested in it as uh, a zero energy light source. Um, but also beyond the building, they offer the potential for this kind of infrastructural application of living technologies. Um, potentially redefining street lighting, um, providing light in areas without electricity. Um, and it's, well, it's, a, it's a natural phenomenon. Um, you can find it in mushroom, you know, from mushrooms, jellyfish, octopus. Um, and we went through a huge process of analysis to look at what was the most viable um, kind of source. Um, selecting a photobacterium phosphorium and through this process and and we've been developing systems in which we try and optimize optimize the kind of light emittance prolong it's obviously a living uh, a living thing optimize um its lifespan um to come up with a series of kind of concepts um and systems that provide nutrients and remove waste kind of trying to you know maximize this out light output um, a load of studies, this is not a great picture here, but looking at patterning and how you can create kind of these really interesting facades using agar and um, other solutions. Um, and then we had a, a great student who did a, a wonderful prototype um, looking at how we might turn it, this into a, a, a kind of a product, a light fitting. And um, this is Aora, um, which we're currently still developing. But we think it's a really, really interesting proposal. Um, and this is using um, kind of agar strips and this flushing mechanism, which supplies nutrients or removes waste. And uh, essentially, essentially like um, the um, photobioreactor, is a, a closed system to maintain the kind of the, the life of, of the bacteria within it. Um, moving swiftly on, um, we... Uh, a big project of what uh, ours in the office at the moment is a project on the Isle of Portland, which, if you don't know it, is based on the south coast, um, very famous for its Portland stone. Um, it's got a very poetic relationship to London as the island's been excavated, London's grown. Um, obviously, um, it's been used in some of London's most prominent uh, monuments, St Paul's Cathedral, Buckingham, Buckingham Palace. Um, but now some of these quarries on Portland are kind of coming in to an end and we're looking and we're involved in the regeneration scheme with the Portland Stone and Quarry Trust there looking at, you know, the next stage for these landscapes. Um, and through that process, we've been uh, kind of commissioned to design a series of standing stone sculptures. They're turning one quarry into this almost uh, kind of a sculpture, sculpture park um, where you can experience this landscape and these, these con contextual um, sculptures are placed within it. Um, and, and also an amphitheatre, an open air theatre that we hope is going to be a bit like the Minac. But we were really struck um, whilst going around and speaking to some of the operators of the quarries, the amount of waste that's produced in the quarrying process, up to 80%. Of course, a lot of it is recycled into aggregates, but we, we were, there was an obvious challenge to see whether we could use uh, and create a new material from this um, waste stone. Um, 
So we, we've been working with Brunel. Um, we've be, been developing the material rheology for quite a while, looking at how we 3D print this, uh, testing different mixtures, additives, um, working with um, uh, additive manufacturing experts, uh, as well as um, the Portland Stone and Quarry Trust, so stone carvers, and, and, and kind of almost questioning this, the technology at the same time. Um, these are some early um, 3D printers that were built by our great student Jack at Brunel. Um, and now we're at the stage where we've got a really interesting material. Um, but the question for us is how we do something more, um, particularly if we've got this amazing opportunity to create new sculptures within this landscape that can really test some ideas. So we've been looking to kind of uh, advances in concrete technology. Um, and looking at how we can make this material kind of bioresponsive. Um, and um, so in, in, in concrete technology, you, 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 there's some really great materials emerging which have reduced embodied carbon, they can absorb excess water, they can heal when cracked, they can attract plant life, um, absorb rainwater to grow moss and lichen. Um, and so we're, we're currently looking into these technologies to see how we can apply it to this waste Portland stone material. Um, and as part of this kind of, uh, as a landscaping project really, I think overall, we've been looking and exploring um, other technologies. This is a really interesting group called Carbon Profit who, um, basically come up with a way to increase the fertility of soils and and in turn increase their kind of capacity to absorb carbon so this idea of um, responsive architecture could extend to the landscape uh, uh, as well thanks emma um, these are part of that extension of the landscape is is Obviously, when you go to, this is in Portland, again, as Emma mentioned, you interpret the landscape from ma many different scales and many different levels. And so this here is um, an entrance point, which, as Emma mentioned, um, into um, Quarry Park in Portland, and it's a sculpture park. Um, and working with Portland Sculpture and Quarry Trust, we were sort of um, interested in actually how do you create markers or spaces within this landscape that can draw upon um, the obvious sort of natural environment which in Portland the light is absolutely incredible it's part of the reason why limestone um, is there in itself is because of the, the fossilization of sunlight and crustaceans animal crustaceans and so um, these standing stones were essentially um, we did some light studies as to how the actual um, shadows might cast. Can the stones cast shadows upon each other? The volumes of these, um, these limestone and even the porosity. Um, we're looking at, as Emma said, can these um, markers in the landscape promote um, habitat? So, you know, there are niches within uh, that are for wildlife. Uh, can mosses grow um, and almost if the, if the stones themselves are porous, light will pass through to animate uh, the ground in itself. We're, we're working with uh, artists um, and Anthony Gormley is one of the, the, the first artists down there to, to help uh, save this piece of land 30 years ago and they're continuously working uh, with this same landscape um, with Portland Sculpture and Quarry Trust. Um, so just recently the ground was levelled in pre prep preparation. Uh, this is Hannah and Paul on the right part from the Portland Culture and Quarry Trust. And they've been working tirelessly with this landscape for 30 years, um, engaging schools, engaging uh, universities, um, engaging professionals to actually take time to actually ex examine the landscape before you make an action. And this is really... Um, one project which is a culmination of that, um, working with biologists, um, ecologists, um, you know, um, UNESCO, all of these different bodies will come on board to, to actually interpret the same landscape because we are inheriting this landscape and it's, it's ours to actually um, to understand and also to, to educate and to, for the young people, for the next generation, to give something uh, for, you know, to pass on. 
So these projects are s signifiers in this sort of long-term thinking. Um, as Emma mentioned, this other project on the same island on the East Cliff where is the first fall um, when Christopher Wren uh, came down to the island. Um, it's this rock face on the East Cliff that he saw um, the limestone used to, to, to build St Paul's Cathedral. But it, it's been quarried and so there's, there's a huge excavation and I don't have all the photographs here today but um, this is the original rock face on the edge and we're looking at regenerating this, um, this piece of land here which is essentially a, 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 a concave um, for a better word, a hole in the ground. Uh, but this is a project which we're working again with local uh, schools. Um, this is a performance space, an amphitheatre. Um, and a lot of the research projects that Emma's sort of explained, we're looking to actually implement into this, um, into this project because it's an um, exposed environment. Um, the sea, uh, the light, um, the sound of the space is all generated from this natural environment. So as a performance space, uh, we can see a sort of crystallization of a lot of um, our research into a, into a, a, a live project. Um, a project which we've just completed um, in Denmark was our, um, it's an art project in fact to commission um, and it was sort of taking a, a lot of these um, concepts but looking at it in a, in a again sort of a, a short, in this case it was a short term research project from August 31st to October 2nd um, the municipality asked us can you make an installation that talks about um, the natural environment in this on this coastline, it's, a, it's um, the Wadden Sea, is the sea that's on the west coast of Denmark, and again, it's a world heritage coastline, so the nature is quite special and quite sensitive. So um, we had to be very selective of our materials. Um, excuse me. So um, we worked in three strands here, the design, the construction, and in this process um, we worked again with local communities. Um, we worked with schools, architecture, um, Aarhus, Aarhus School of Architecture to educate in the construction process. And of course at the end of the, of, of the installation when we opened to the public, um, we, we worked with psychologists to actually um, sort of look at the behaviour studies um, as a possible outcome from this in installation. As Emma said, at the beginning, we work very collaboratively, so this involved the municipality, which is Van Haven, and um, we worked with Beth Collier, who's a, a, a psychologist. She has a company called Therapy in Nature, which she, she, re she takes re or rehabilitates people using nature as a medium. And um, we worked with our School of Architecture, um, for students came down to help us build it and uh, we worked with Brunel University Computer Science Department to develop uh, an app uh, for to study the, the behaviour, um, the, hu the human behaviour aspect. This is the Cosigns, very popular um, destination for tourists um, but there were 12, 10 different projects, international projects um, commissioned, uh, so we were number six up there on the, on the edge of the coast um, and there was a number of various different scales of projects. Um, again, as Emma said, we, we like working directly with the natural forces, so we placed ourselves in a zone where the sea could actually come in um, and also um, the wind, of course, we were quite vulnerable. So um, the design um, was actually looking at what can we monitor in this um, in this environment? Is there something that we can learn from uh, in this process? And you'll see that a lot of these dunes um, are made of these, uh, well, a planting of of of, of seam grasses, 
Um, so we decided to explore that sort of coastal erosion and how actually our, our coast managed. Is there an architectural space that we could uh, generate a space for people to um, take shelter? Um, so within this beach uh, coastline, you see these spiral shapes, which are essentially sand dunes that we planted uh, with grass. We, we were at a very limited budget, and so again, the, the sensitivity of the materiality uh, was heavily um, inspected by the municipality. So we, we used these wooden poles, almost a thousand of them, to generate a landscape or a space within the landscape. And the, these poles act about reinforcing the sand. So by banging the poles in, you, as soon as you place one in, you're changing the dynamic nature of that space. Um, so is, it's the Wadden Sea is quite rough and quite, um, um, it's difficult to predict. Even the coastline changes. Um, it's a 400 mile coastline all the way down to Denmark. So we set this system up, not knowing what the potential outcome could, would be, but um, we wanted to sort of set up a system that could be essentially destroyed or taken over by the sea. Um, the sea would, would come in uh, through the installation. And when it recedes at low tide, that these spaces within, people could actually uh, take shelter. Um, some days, uh, take some time out, but create this space that is both for human and natural um, environments. Um, the construction process was really quite fun. It was two weeks to build this. Uh, this is Ule. He arrived every morning uh, with a beer. He was a volunteer, and that's how he started his day. We were like four, 12, <laughs> or sorry, about 10 projects, about, I think, 12 to 14 different artists. We all had our materials in this car park close to the coastline. And, and then every day, we would sort of work very site-specific. And in that, we sort of learned a lot. When you're trying to imagine what creating an installation, in this case, on a very vulnerable coastline with dynamic forces, um, you can only predict so much. So when we started to place our first uh, poles in, even the, the way that we set out um, the, the, these lines, these, these guidelines, after a day's work, we realized that whatever way the wind was blowing, we stood back and realized there was a very slight curvature to the, to the way that the, the string, so all of the wooden poles are actually curved. So we decided to actually um, reconfigure our sort of thinking of how can we actually create a more dynamic geometry within this. Um, and it's just very, these, these simple lessons, but you realize that when you're working directly with nature, you have to constantly be observing and, and listening and watching um, for change because essentially uh, by doing so you, you, you sort of learn and be it becomes a sort of uh, reciprocal environment uh, to build essentially. Um, so local schools came to help us bang in these poles and um, again it was, a, they were, some of them were art students, some of them architecture, but we'd, we'd explain what we're trying to do and they really enthusiastically get on board and we spend the day sort of, um, you know, building bit by bit and sort of sharing our experiences. So the actual process of making was, was both an exchange, a sort of collaborative exchange. Um, these are some drone pictures of the work in progress. Uh, you can see the Wadden Sea there um, at low tide. Um, some aerial shots. These are the piles of wood and then we would sort of set them out. Um, and Again, they were just, it was uh, an opportunity to learn about um, designing with directly with, with the natural, um, within the natural environment. Um, we had some refugees came for the day who were, you know, re again, coming in to, to find work. It was really interesting to hear their stories, um, you know, and equally sharing ours. Um, part of these sand dunes sort of were, were there to promote the sort of natural environment. So this um, diving beetle sort of found its home already as we were working there. Um, so by, as soon as by creating a space within a uh, natural environment, you start to learn about the habitats that live there with you. Um, and the Brunel research sort of 
was hinged around these QR codes. Um, and in this, we sort of worked with creating um, different questions within the installation that could sort of monitor the behavior change. Um, there is a small video here, which I'll try and find, which shows it when it's open to the public. So just like the natural forces, you sort of see this dynamic change of people sort of beginning to spiral into the space and start to use it. Uh, it's always a really nice thing when you make something to see how it's used. Um, you know, some of the kids were saying, oh, it's like a maze. Some of them were looking at the, at the QR codes, um, which questions were asked. And it, again, it, was, it became this sort of research project of almost looking at dynamic landscapes and, and enjoyment. And in this case, you know, tourists were using it. Um, And so here is a view, again, we wanted it to work with and almost looking at the, the sort of design aesthetic that it almost merged with the landscape. Um, so it became sort of, again, this sort of symbiotic relationship between a, a natural system and a man-made system. Uh, this is a close-up of the QR code um, an overview from a height of the, of the installation from a high point in the dune. Um, and as we began since the installation, um, we've actually had some research. Oh, just to say that, yeah, there was, um, you know, the, the local Danish TV came on board, we were quite supportive of the project. Um, there, were, um, there were many different projects. Uh, these are just a few uh, snips to, to show you. Um, Danish um, artists created these interactive structures that would be pushed around by people, again, floating uh, when the tide comes in. Um, Danish architect um, couple who created this, this small jetty, and inside they had this looking, this viewing platform. Um, a Japanese artist who created these paper sculptures these of, uh, of different animals inside <coughs> these, these glass jars. Um, a French uh, couple created this landscape of IKEA watering jugs that looked like birds. Uh, and at the very top, you can see bird water inside one of the, the actual uh, bunkers. And um, again, it's sort of an, kind of an illusion of space, really. This um, a Canadian artist created a, a lookout point um, on top of the dunes. Um, and Bungi, a South, South Korean artist, created these almost DNA structures from wood and he carved every day uh, on the beach. Um, Anna created these um, organs, basically. They're, the wind passed through these sewage pipes and each one was tuned to have a, a different note. So when the wind played, it, it played like a musical instrument. Um, but just to show the sort of variety of looking at the same landscape, you can start to enjoy um, and sort of design different spaces. Um, the local town planners came and visited us for the day. It was opened by local politicians. Um, Princess Marie, which is a, of Denmark, the royal family came along, uh, which is always nice. Um, and just a final strand on this was the, as I mentioned briefly earlier on, was the sort of learning outcomes from this project um, working with Brunel and this um, and um, and the psychologist, we were working with Beth. Um, we sort of created this app, and the QR codes which you saw on the installation were triggered by all of these questions. So we had all these different questions and different places within the installation where we could um, sort of collect people's um, feedback from the installation. Um, we sort of closed it with, there's actually behavioral studies being done at the moment by the, the data. So we've got a, about a thousand points of information where Brunel University are doing a sort of what's called a Geneva wheel of um, 
Sorry. Yeah, it's our Geneva wheel of, of diagnosis where we can actually map the emotional response to the space and overlay that with the weather map. Um, so we're actually getting an insight into how the behavior of people, the, the sort of um, almost the emotional response to this environment and see if we could use this information to um, learn from for other projects. Um, so I think we will finish there. Um, other than to say thank you. Um, and we'll take questions, I guess. <laughs> <laughs>
starting the group really is to test and trial some of these these materials and ideas ourselves before we say to the client do you want to take some of these big risks so um and I mean, yeah, like, like the oxide, I mean, even specifying green walls and roofs, you get a bit of a panic about, you know, what happens when this changes over mm -hmm. time. Um, and, and things like the embodied carbon database, having developing, you know, other kind of systems alongside the technologies to kind of prove their worth or prove how they're going to perform. Um, we're finding is a really valid way to get at least getting the getting the getting on the table and having that discussion um, and seeing how willing clients are to kind of yeah, get involved. Well, I mean, For yeah, I mean, I, I think the, I mean, generally the warranties are on these are like 50 years. So, but I think what we're talking about here is when you take algae is that you're actually creating a, a living system that is, that can live. It's the oldest organism living system on the planet. So we kind of say, well, actually, if it can absorb CO2, um, in this case, uh, we're looking at it as a biomass. It absorbs CO2. You can generate electricity for your building. I understand that. You put it in a plastic tube. The plastic tube's got life. Mm. Sure. Sure. Well, <laughs> I think, well, well, the way we see it is that it's we're using a material, in this case, to actually cr create a productive outcome from the architecture. So, I mean, absorbing CO2 is a is a is a is a beneficial aspect as a material mm -hmm. choice, um, because it actually is sequesters and in, in this case, you know, algae also produces oxygen. You know, so you actually have this this living material, um, which is good for the natural environment, but it's also can create enclosure for for us uh, habitat. So it's it's not saying that we are. You know, we are looking at, uh, we're actually looking at w other scientific practices that are sort of evolving along this realm um, and seeing, you know, is there a space here that is architectural? Um, and so, yeah. I mean, do, do you see the, like, with the glass tube, do you see that as a, as that's a, like a starting point, like a prototype in a way, and then you look at, uh, at potentially then you look at how that material might coexist with some other. Exactly. So, so at the moment, it's like it, it, it potentially is something that is, is like applied mm. to a facade, but ultimately it seems like you're more interested in making it part of the. Yeah, I think it's safe to say we don't, never really know the answers when we're starting on the on the journey, but more that we need to do things differently as we stand. We need to do better sustainability and we do need to look at our emissions and you know how can we do that and it's just about exploring options and maybe and, the, and the, there's a lot of dead ends i mean we've really struggled to find the viability with the algae technology if we're if we're being honest but there's interesting potential in certain ways from it um, so yeah some of them aren't viable options and they're fraught with fought with challenges but until you kind of even even test it or get the conversation know it, going about that there is an alternative way um, and it's not to dismiss the Victorian terrace because it's probably the most adaptable and you know you know typology that's been around and it, it fulfills a purpose but how could we build that you know what other materials could improve its you know environmental performance um, um, yeah I think <laughs> I'll repeat the question. Uh, I was quite intrigued by the images you had of the algae test in your office. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering when you're exploring what algae can do or what it can be used for, where do you start? How do you know which 
um, alligator to put in the box? How do you know what to do with it? <laughs> um, how, how do you start that whole process? I think by talking to people, um, and it's, it's just what we found, um, it's just there's so much expertise out there, but we're kind of, as a build, building industry, we don't really know how to tap into it. But once you've got a foot through the door, um, in terms of you, you know, meeting Brunel, you, you've made aware of this amazing realm of expertise um, from, I don't know, uh, ecologists to biologists who are developing really interesting things yet haven't really thought about maybe how it could be applied and how it could be used in the building industry and, and getting these people together to have discussions about potentials of you know emerging or materials and technologies and, and other ideas um, has been a just amazing starting point and we you know before this conversation start we don't really know that we're going to look into this particular material because mm -hmm. but it's just coming together as a synergy the synergy with the individual who has a vision and an interest and a passion to collaborate and isn't doesn't come with an ego or a, a kind of I don't know, uh, you know, wanting to control the output, but and yeah, we kind of go with the flow, and we didn't really think we'd end up in Denmark, for example, and that even going to America um, potentially with that project, you kind of you meet people and they develop, and yeah. I think, that's I think yeah, it's a lot of trial and error. So I think um, you know, experimentation with scientists is really, you know, it's part of. Some of these projects are are about f you know failing with it. So I think it's you just begin somewhere. And you know I think as an architect, I've always been interested in uh, questions of nature. What is like question every time a generation obviously um, inherits the, the process of looking around your environment. And so I think it's interesting to talk to scientists because. A lot of these questions are similar to, um, you know, all different disciplines, and so I think you can learn a lot from, like, questioning different parts of and areas of of, of natural systems, uh, you know, biological or, you know, and so it's we enjoy it. So <laughs> I think that's where we, it starts, I guess. I won't comment on Brexit and what's potentially going to happen now. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, government backtracks on, say, co-sustainable homes and what that means for the industry, I mean, we've just, you know, good clients still want it and will still drive it and still see that it's valid and we've all been working towards it. But I think it's also about, and it's what we're really trying to do, about industry and architects and clients stepping up and saying, we still are going to work towards this and work on track and try and deliver it mm. um, and not wait for it to be implemented by regulation. Mm. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one good thing about being an architect is you can actually, you know, you can actually sell vi a vision sometimes to people. Mm. You, have a, you have a lot of skills and you're trained as architects to think about something that isn't there um, and so I think it's a really interesting place to be like to as an architect because when you talk to people and um, sometimes you have solutions to things or ideas that mm -hmm. people haven't thought of um, and so yeah I'm optimistic um, to you can't affect you can vote, of course, but you can't affect the outcomes of those things. So when you do get a, 
a Brexit scenario, you just have to think, what can I actually do to continue? Um, and yeah, I, th I think uh, there's always opportunities emerge and just being, like, being versatile and listen to the people, what they think. Uh, you, you know, you find projects like the, the, the Danish project was a 4,000 euro commission and um, wasn't big, but it was an artist project. And then, you know, I've started to talk to three states in the US who are also looking at coastal erosion. Um, and they've got, you know, big projects which are trying to monitor vast coastlines, um, but without taking a chance and doing a project which you sort of have a gut feeling for, then, you know, things happen. Um, yeah. But I can't control the political landscape. So, sure, I know. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>